Hello and welcome to a special program on SARC, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. To discuss SARC's promise and potential, we have a distinguished panel in the studios of Kantipur TV in Kathmandu. The panelists, starting with Bangladesh Ambassador, Her Excellency Mashri Binti Shams, India's Ambassador, His Excellency Ranjit Ray. From Nepal, we have its Minister for Commerce, the Honorable Sunil Bayadur Thapa. And I'm Moses Manoharan, the moderator for your discussion today. We have a theme for this SARC um, program. It's called SARC's Success Story. Madam Ambassador, does that seem to you a realistic uh, aspiration or is it just a fanciful hope? Um, thank you very much. Um, actually, I think it is a, a, a very interesting uh, theme that you have chosen, uh, successes of SARC, because um, we all, f those of us who have had some experience with the SARC process, uh, do feel that SARC is um, unfortunately got a let lot, gets a lot of negative press. Um, because um, most people refer to SARC as only a talk, you know, um, talk, uh, talk show or a place where they just uh, get together annually and go away and nothing gets done. But uh, SARC has had some successes in the last 30 years. And um, we need to also th remember that we need to put things in perspective. So if we think how SARC was established and uh, what was the region like, when uh, SARC was established. I think, um, of course, even though there's a lot, long way to go, but uh, there are some successes there. Madam Ambassador, you are being very modest. Um, Bangladesh played a pivotal role in the um, very foundation of SARC. Um, yes, Bangladesh um, was one of the uh, mooted, the idea of SARC, but uh, SARC would never have got off if the other countries of the region had not come forward and supported Bangladesh. And, um, you know, uh, when we think of SARC, that at least um, at that time, all of us were going our separate ways in our development uh, agenda. We were going our separate ways in trade and commerce, and uh, we were all in our uh, separate entities. Uh, SARC gave us a platform where the leaders could get together, where they can talk of some, identify some common areas of interest and uh, work out ways to strengthen those areas of interest. And uh, if not uh, always uh, going at the pace that uh, people would want it to, they can at least, uh, you know, uh, set down some, uh, identify some core areas of interest, such as poverty alleviation, um, you know, uh, agriculture, human resource development, um, you know, security, uh, connectivity, trade, so these are very vital areas of interest to all the member countries. And uh, there are very many ways that we can work together to, to go ahead in these areas. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Ray, you come, your country represents an overwhelming kind of a weight on shark. It can be almost a banyan tree which um, smothers other nations or it can make a shelter under which everybody grows. There's a new government under Prime Minister Modi brimming with confidence, economic resurgence. How does that augur for the rest of the countries of SARC? Very positively, I think. And I'm very optimistic. I think India is very optimistic about SARC. I think SARC is really an idea whose time has come. In today's world, everyone talks about regional integration, global integration. No country can grow in isolation. And I think the same is true of South Asia. It is very, very important to grow in an interconnected fashion, whether for peace and stability, whether for economic development, progress, prosperity of our peoples. We have similar problems. Mm. So I think there is a huge potential. And you said, uh, you referred to the new government in India. I think uh, Prime Minister Modi's government, a clear foreign policy priority is neighborhood for, first. And indeed, some of the very first trips that he made as prime minister were to the neighborhood. He invited all the leaders of SARC uh, to his swearing-in ceremony. So it's very clear that the focus of the new government is on the neighborhood. And SARC plays a very pivotal role in that. So we are very optimistic about SARC. We believe that SARC uh, needs to become more dynamic 
and also reach out to the people. It cannot just be res restricted to the level of the government or you know, certain sectors of the economy. I think it really needs to reach out to the peoples of our countries. They must feel very much that they're part of SARC. So overall, I think we are very optimistic and uh, we look forward to a revitalized, very dynamic SARC playing a critical role of, for economic integration and prosperity in our region. As a senior uh, foreign service person, you may appreciate this uh, nicety here. Is there a nuanced uh, diplomatic dilemma for India? Because India, um, unlike the rest of uh, SARC, does also have a significant global role. How do you balance the prioritizing of uh, regional considerations with global aspirations? See, both are very important. But I think primarily, if India is to grow, develop, prosper, India needs a peaceful neighborhood. If we have a neighborhood that is unstable, then that will willy-nilly impinge on our progress, prosperity, and stability. So that's extremely important. At the same time, in order to grow, we need capital, we need technology, we need uh, you know, the best of uh, uh, technology available in the world. So clearly the world is extremely important, and there are a lot of global issues with international ramifications. So I don't think you can say that you know, this is important or that is important. I think for any country, and certainly for India, both the global context and the regional and the immediate neighborhood context are very critical uh, to our pursuit of uh, uh, prosperity and development. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, Mr. Minister, um, this SARC summit in Kathmandu, is, would you see it as a coming out for Nepal after a decade of um, unrest, um, lack of um, stagnation of the economy? Is this a coming out? Is this a bright future? Will this um, you know, hope for the future spread across SARC? As well, of course. Uh, let me just put one thing uh, quite clearly uh, in addition to Her Excellency is that you know, one of the major stories of SARC is at least to bring all head of the states together in this last 29 years together to have dialogue. Dialogue is very important. So I think this is the most successful element to this whole prospect. Now, when you look at the future of SARC, one thing is very eminent is in the last two years, we've had uh, elected government in all the four countries. Like, you know, you talk about Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, and also followed by Afghanistan. So when you look at all these leaders who've been elected, you know, they all have a vision. And I'm sure there's a commitment to, you know, for the growth of SARC. And we can see that because when I was in Bhutan, I saw a very strong commitment among all the SARC uh, foreign ministers as well as, you know, commerce minister putting in together new thought of how, you know, we should take SARC together in the coming days. So I think Kathmandu will play a very vital role in coming up with new declaration and especially on the economic side uh, of the uh, declaration. Um, Nepal, as in as other countries, uh, for instance, um, Bhutan or uh, Sri Lanka, all of them have had uh, very localized domestic issues. Where does SARC step in to give special attention to such countries when they face greater challenges than the rest? No, once you look at it, uh, at the history, if you look at the history of South Asia as a whole, whenever something happens to one nation, it gets affected to the other. If you're talking about insurgency, it happened in Nepal, uh, ba Bangladesh, to some ex extent, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, and also disturbance in India, followed by Pakistan and Afghanistan. But I think we get to learn from each other, and that, that is the beauty of coming in together. And I think the dialogue that I just told you about bringing all head of the states together plays a very vital role, despite of your own domestic problem, is how each one can help each other to find a solution to look forward. Is, very, is it very important for the heads of government, whatever their, their uh, bilateral issues, to come together for SARC? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, when they come in together, uh, together, a lot of things are discussed and a lo lot of issues are also like, taken into consideration because apart from the main SARC summit, you have these bilateral meetings. A lot of things comes up open so that this, you know, as I said, the dialogue is the most important thing. As long as dialogue continues, there is hope, and I think that hope now is turning into reality. 
So you'll, you'll make a distinction between dialogue and what Madam Ambassador says is that uh, critics of, the, of Sark say it is just a talk fest and people just come and talk. So talk as opposed to dialogue. No, I mean, you, you, know, you, you could define things the way you want, but if the critic had been too critical, then you know, we would not be traveling all the way to the 18th summit. So when we come to the 18th summit, we realize that certain things have, have happened. And of course, you need talk to make things happen as well. So I think that is a one great success of SARC, which is that at the end of the day, whatever the problems within SARC, the, all eight heads of government of the SARC members, states, come together. Absolutely. Irrespective Very important. of whatever happens. Um, I think we'll just take a commercial break here and come back. Video Khan Experience Change Welcome back to this discussion, which is uh, riveting as far as I can feel. The, this part of the program is on the most uh, important factor most people feel of SARC, and that is the economy. How it progresses may determine the future of SARC, the scholars say. So we go to the country which has the biggest role to play in this, India, and its ambassador, Ambassador Ray. What is your feeling? Can can the success or the, the great uh, confidence uh, which India is brimming with under Prime Minister Modi lift SARC? Oh, absolutely. I think the economic integration is the critical objective. And indeed, at the forthcoming uh, Kathmandu summit, uh, the, the theme of the summit is deeper integration for peace and prosperity. So I think there is realization across the region that we must integrate economically. And you can see this happening in other regions of the world. So clearly, this is a very, very important priority. And if you look at earlier SARC summits as well, I think the two key focus areas have been trade and connectivity. And when I talk about trade, it's not only trade in goods, but also in services. And if you add investments to that, uh, so a lot of the focus of SARC has been in developing this uh, free trade area, which of course, should be doing better than it is at present because under SAFTA, I think our total uh, uh, trade within SARC is only uh, some $3 billion, whereas uh, intra-SARC trade as a whole is about $30 billion. So it's only about 10%. So we have a long way to go. Similarly, the trade in services, I think some countries have given their uh, offers, others are yet to give it. But I think once we have this legal framework in place, uh, we should move rapidly towards more economic integration. Second aspect is connectivity. It's all very well to have agreements, but if you don't have physical connectivity or air connectivity or rail connectivity or even digital connectivity, how do you trade? So connectivity is the other key area. And here I would say if you look at infrastructure, I think there's a huge need to develop this connectivity. And happily, uh, I can inform your viewers that India has already initiated several connectivity uh, projects at a bilateral level, but the end result of these projects is that you have a regional connectivity framework uh, in place. And the same is true of energy. If you look at the bilateral programs India has with Nepal, with Bhutan, with Bangladesh, uh, and the electricity grids that are coming up, you can see the beginnings of a, a regional uh, connectivity arrangement for uh, power, uh, power sh uh, trading and exchange uh, within SARC. So I think these two are very critical factors in order to achieve uh, our objective of economic uh, integration. Thank you. Madam Ambassador, how far is SARC and um, Bangladesh, for instance, willing to go in lowering um, <clears throat> trade barriers um, tariffs, um, working towards um, currency swaps where uh, one 
uh, where unfortunately one, one currency will dominate, how far is it willing to go? And what is the fear of being swamped? Um, at least in Bangladesh, um, I think the fear of being swamped is uh, you know, not really very valid. Uh, because Bangladesh, uh, as you know, it's one of the is the second largest garments ready-made garments exporter in the world. Uh, it has um, a huge workforce. Uh, it has a um, comparative advantage where uh, labor is concerned, where services is concerned. Um, so I don't think being swamped is the issue here. Um, Bangladesh has uh, been uh, very working very constructively towards the lowering of tariffs uh, under SAFTA and also bilaterally. And uh, we are also uh, working towards, um, as Ambassador mentioned, uh, towards connectivity, uh, you know, the, to have a better facilitate free movement of goods uh, across the border to, through India to Nepal, Bhutan, uh, through India towards Sri Lanka. Uh, so all those are uh, going to help uh, this true free movement of goods and uh, work towards the integration. Um, as Ambassador was mentioning, unless you have uh, the connectivity in place, uh, nothing is really going to move forward. Um, it costs more to call from Nepal to Bangladesh, a telephone call from Nepal to Bangladesh costs more than it costs uh, to call USA or UK. So if you have this sort of a system, that's not going to help your regional integration. It doesn't make sense. Uh, so we need to uh, work on uh, dismantling all these barrier barriers that we have. Thank you. Um, Mr. Minister, um, both the ambassadors have just talked about goods and services. Now the very crucial point at which um, EU is floundering a little is the movement of human capital across borders. In this, uh, um, Nepal is in a, in a blessed space where you have free movement of people between Nepal and India, and there is you know, hardly any um, checks on this. So can, this be, can you see this ideal being replicated right across South? Well, uh, of course. Well, first let me say that you know, uh, when the government in Nepal, India was formed, it was very great, with great significance that Prime Minister Modi came up with a very strong message to the region saying that, you know, the region has to prosper with development prosperity. That means he, you know, overshadowed the political agenda of the region, which is very good. And I think, in my view, that the 18 SAC summit will really focus more on economic agenda than the political agenda. So in that respect, when you talk about, you know, human being having access to each other country, that helps a lot. Because at the end of the day, when you talk about services and trade, as what uh, Her, His Excellency very rightly said, so, uh, we, with human resources being transferred, services become one of the major uh, component to the whole factor. And in, today in Nepal, we have really gained a lot with access of human resources crossing border without any barriers. Uh, so I think if this could happen, and in fact, we have been talking a lot on getting free visas in the Sark nation, which has now only been limited to prominent people or artists or you know, people who are involved in sports as businessmen. And I think this is also, so we should broaden the definition of visa regime in, this, in the region so that people can have access to each other's country. And also expertise, for instance, um, India, which, is, which has its uh, international expertise on IT, can share that with others only through um, reasonable movement of free movement of uh, professionals. Uh, Bangladesh must be doing something right when uh, its um, government industry is thriving and others around are not. So here we have um, um, a need to exchange professionals. And well, if you look at Sark region and its potential economically, we are, I could say that you know we are the best and we, we, we have a lot of potential. When I talk about best, I'm trying to link with potential, you know. And I think by sharing each other's experience and what we have, you know, we could regionally become one of the strongest region in the world, both on human index as well as in capital index and then in terms of infrastructure. I mean, so where on earth could you ever find the potential of, you know, the amount of electricity that can be generated in Sark Nation? And if you look at agriculture, put 
all the eight countries together, the amount of agricultural product that we can have is immense. So we have great another success here in that we don't lack in producing um, uh, people of high caliber perpetually or doing businesses like um, IT and government industry in Bangladesh, which, but unfortunately the, the best and the brightest are abroad and the success of SAC may bring them back, we hope. Well, there is. I mean, people are coming back uh, after seeing potential. I, I, you know, after working with United Nations for 23 years, you know, I've come back to Nepal, and there are similar stories uh, in other Sark nation as well. Thank you, Mr. Minister. We'll take another short break before we come back again. Mr. Minister, the, we have two examples, shining or not, I don't know, before us. ASEAN, EU, and we have other kinds of groupings, some military, some economic. What are the lessons that SAR can learn from them? Well, if you look at, well, first of all, you have to look at the formation of SAR. That is very important. Under what pretext this whole SAR was, uh, you know, formed. And secondly is... You know, we're learning through our own practices and how we can be the best or how we can put things together. So at this moment, for me, I would look at SARC as taking back our own experience and the areas that we need to cooperate. So when you talk about EU and ASEAN, you're also talking about a very different economic perspective. And today SARC is looking for a better economic perspective and development. So I think at the moment that we have to really look is to how we can upgrade our own SARC activities within that framework that you know we are engaged in. So I would not really jump into uh, EU's model or ASEAN model and try to complicate like you know things that are already moving in. So I think we have to give continuity to I mean say what we are doing, and secondly is to look at our own perspective to see what we what we want to reach and what we want to do. Um, Madam Ambassador, would you would you would you take it further and say that? You know, EU, for instance, has, has um, you know, worked towards, whether successful or not, a common currency, uh, many, many steps towards borderless um, entities. So should we be thinking of wor working ourselves towards that? Of course, um, in a way, that would be what eventually we would all aspire to, to have a borderless world, not only a borderless region, but uh, globally we should be borderless or globally we should be all economically integrated. Um, but the challenges that, uh, that face the SARC member countries is very different from the challenges that uh, faced the EU countries when EU was established or when the ASEAN was established. And their path towards integration and their goal of integration was certainly different from our goal of integration. Uh, right now, the SARC countries, uh, despite our economic successes, we do face challenges of poverty, of health issues, of you know the, the uh, sanitation, education. There are so many human uh, you know uh, challenges that we face, and we need to work together first of all to improve the lives of our people, and then slowly I think we can start to move much more aspire towards a much more aspiring uh, EU model of integration. Uh, may I interrupt, uh, Madam Ambassador? Um, the EU, for instance, it also faces um, great disparities. The, uh, for instance, the countries of Eastern Europe, which are coming in, have great uh, differences in standards of living. So there has been that problem, and they have been coping. I don't know how well, but they are coping. Yes, uh, I'm not talking of disparities. I'm saying that individually, all of our countries are working towards the Millennium Development Goals and the post-2015 development agenda, uh, the SAR countries need to work together towards uh, achieving, to, towards a realistic dialogue towards that, towards a more achievable and sustainable development agenda. And um, 
of course, uh, the, the integration, the borderless world, the economic integration, the common currency, those are, I'm saying that we all do aspire towards that. That's the ideal. But the path towards uh, how we achieve that or uh, the, the historical background towards uh, achieving that will be much different. Our experience will be much different because our challenges are very different. Uh, just coming back before, Ambassador, uh, to the Minister, um, much of the challenge of uh, EU and to a lesser extent ASEAN, and I think greatly in uh, SARC, is the issue of identity. And especially when similar, almost similar cultures live uh, across each other's borders. Nepal again is unique in that it seems to have just merged its identity when it chooses with India and Indians merge it uh, with the uh, Nepalese. So is there any message in this which you can give to the rest of SARC? Well, I, I think uh, well, one of the best things that with being neighbors to, in the neighborhood that we've been living with Harmony and you've never come across any kind of border clashes or anything. So you could imagine the social fabric that we have when it ta comes into, uh, you know, integration and other social aspect. So I, I think our example as South Asia has been of tremendous success in the region and that we can also show it to the world when it comes to either inter-border or intra-border. So I think if this continues and if you're able to promote this harmony, we'll be able to uh, sort of, uh, you know, show our success to other nations as well. Because if you look at EU, as you talked about disparity, we do have disparity, but then, you know, this disparity is sort of like overrides because of our strong social fabric and bounds. I put it to you, Ambassador, um, slightly unhappily for this uh, group, I think, that the agenda which Madam Ambassador is talking about may be overtaken by the agenda of youth, the generations which are coming after us. And they have a different agenda and they may not be so um, patient in waiting for change and millennium goals. And India, above all, should be very responsive to this, having such a big population of young. No, absolutely. I think all of us have to listen to our youth. And I see our youthful population as a huge asset to this entire region. Because if we, you know, if we have a youthful population, which is very dynamic, very industrious, uh, so we have a huge comparative uh, advantage internationally. If you look at Western countries, they all have aging populations. Our part of the world is lucky to have this uh, very youthful, very dynamic population. So it's a great asset to our uh, economic development of the region as a whole. But coming back to the earlier point you made about lessons learned from the European Union and ASEAN, I would agree with uh, what um, Ambassador Mashvi uh, has said about uh, uh, eventual aspirations. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, some of the good lessons that have been, uh, can be learned, for instance, from the European Union model, you know, is uniform standards. You can travel from one country to another in Europe on highways with the same signage, you know, so it's almost seamless connectivity. And I think that's something we should try and do in our own region or look at infrastructure. The manner in which the advanced uh, European countries have supported um, the relatively late entrance into the European Union in upgrading their infrastructure to a certain common standard. So I think things like that uh, certainly are of great uh, practical relevance uh, to, to our own region. And if I may add, why uh, look as far as the European Union and ASEAN? Look at our own region itself. Within our region, every country has excelled in something or the other. Uh, you know, there is microfinance in Bangladesh. So we can look at all these success stories and actually emulate them in our own countries. So I think there's a huge potential, lot of things that can be done, lot of things that can be learned from different examples and different experiences. So I, I feel overall extremely optimistic at the manner in which uh, we are trying to integrate regionally within SARC. But um, doing things uh, in the SARC way and capturing the imagination of people as, you know, as EU and ASEAN has done, uh, they have captured the imagination. It's center stage in uh, EU. You know, if you look at the papers in Europe, they, you know, big issues, discussions go on. Same uh, in ASEAN all the time over different kinds of issues. That... Capturing of people's imagination, I, 
think is not there in Sark. Why is that? I agree with you. I think, yes, I agree. I think Sark, at least in the public perception, is very much a government affair. You know, people are not involved. And I think that is a huge drawback. And I think that is something we really need to examine and see how Sark can be uh, something very much a part of the lives of the peoples of, of this region. So I think that's a very valid point. And I think that is something we need to focus on and, 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 and you know, see how to, to bring the people into Sark. Um, one way Europe became, EU became part of the people was through uh, bold economic decisions. Like they pushed ahead due, uh, despite opposition from big countries uh, for Maastricht to happen and uh, for a common currency to be adopted. That bold step, can India do it? You see, I mean, A, you must all, you know, you said in the very beginning that the region is such that, you know, there is a lot of asymmetry in size. And so I think India, being the largest country, has to be very conscious of that. And I think that's very important. You have to take everybody along at a pace at which everyone feels comfortable. So, you know, this is very much a voluntary process where everybody is a stakeholder and everybody is comfortable at the pace at which uh, economic integration or developments within SAAC are taking place. So I think uh, India is very conscious of that. And I think uh, while some may criticize uh, the pace at which SARC uh, is integrating and growing, I think uh, the fact that it's happening, the fact that everyone uh, feels that they are a stakeholder in this process, uh, so while the pace may be slow, I think the direction is right, and I think that should give us some uh, uh, confidence uh, to speed up things in the future. Um, coming to you, Mr. Minister, um, one of the things that, that puts um, EU, for instance, in the, in the forefront, um, and even ASEAN and APEC and all, in a different kind of way, is that the big leaders are always talking about it, you know, whether they're squabbling or they're, but they never ignore it. You know, you have uh, Angela Merkel from Germany, you have uh, Cameron, Prime Minister Cameron from the UK. They all are all the time engaged in the issue of EU, debating it. Um, is that so? I mean, does, do leaders in the region talk that much about SARC? Well, let me add to what uh, His Excellency just said. I mean, from the formation of SARC from 1985, the whole SARC has been totally, you know, government-centric. We never went out of the government holding. And even if you look at the last several years that the different centers or facility centers have been opened in different SARC nations, it has always been given responsibility to government-aided project or with the government. So it could never come out to the people as much as we thought it could. But I think now one of the major issues that has been discussed with uh, in SAFTA, and actually it is the economic binding that brings people together. And I think once we are able to make an agreement on SAFTA, I think that's where the binding between people to people from different regions will open up because that's when the private sectors will jump in to do different business, building infrastructure, connectivity, you name it. Now when you talk about SARC and as they do it in EU, We've not yet found a very strong platform where, like, you know, we could discuss all this from time to time. I mean, so we have to wait for a year to come, and before we join the program, Her Excellency and I were just discussing the same issue, thinking that maybe SARC uh, meetings should be taken every six months without having any stage show, where leaders would just get together and keep on discussing. So we've not yet made that modality, and I think it's very important and one of the now, the area that SAR can be pushed up to be more people, to people friendly, is also through the private sector. Not only that, but um, I think, uh, may I put it to all of you, that uh, one of the most popular things which happen among all the countries is sport. I mean, if when Bangladesh plays a country, I think the whole nation watches. When you play um, uh, football, the whole nation watches. And when small countries defeat big countries, it's a big issue. Um, I know when I was in Afghanistan with uh, President Karzai and uh, Afghanistan had just entered, you know, the top uh, of uh, cricket and people were uplifted. 
So where is that fitting in in all this? SARC does have, um, uh, does need to be more people oriented. I do agree with uh, both the, the distinguished panelists that SARC has been too government centric. Uh, but interestingly, there are so many small bodies, you know, like uh, South Asian architects, mm. they have this platform. South Asian Surgical Association, SARC Lawyers Association, there are many bodies under SARC. Uh, which are uh, not fully government, but these are more private uh, entities which do come together okay, uh, sometimes annually or biennially. They come together, they have meetings, they disseminate organizations, and they do identify themselves as uh, SARC members. So I think that we need to promote that a bit, bit more, and we need to encourage that, that sort of uh, South Asian bonding among all, not only architects and doctors and engineers, but take it down to even more uh, to the common people. Um, sports can be a very important way of promoting SARC. And uh, also, I think uh, the, the media can play a vital role in actually promoting this South Asian identity, uh, the SARC, the role of SARC. Um, and also perhaps think tanks, they, do, they are doing a lot of work, but uh, they need to sort of um, perhaps um, generate more uh, publicity about SARC and introduce more topics on, on SARC-related issues. Perhaps that will, um, uh, that will raise the consciousness of what SARC is doing and what SARC can do. So we must make it less uh, government-centric make it more people-friendly, uh, people and uh, hopefully get the media involved in this. Um, we will now go for a break. Banao rangin jindagi, banao har pal yo khushi, video kaan ko saan. Video kaan, experience change. So distinguished panelists, um, now we are talking about bringing Saak out of um, the side of a uh, closet as it were of of intimate, private discussions among great leaders and making it more public and more people-friendly. How do we go about it? Uh, can we start with you, Ambassador? Well, you know, we have the South Asian Games, for instance, I think hugely popular. We can have a SARC cultural festival every year, you know, even before the summit. We can have a people's SARC. In Europe, uh, you know, you, there is this very popular Eurovision song contest. And it really brings all the countries of Europe together. We can, you know, have similar creative ideas uh, which will engage and involve the vast majority of people, and especially the youth. So I think if we can get the youth interested in SARC, then I think, uh, you know, SARC uh, will really take off. But how do you open the doors? You know, I, uh, yesterday I passed through um, the venue. It is there, you know, secluded, isolated, and you have the rest of um, um, Kathmandu, the population. And this has become a trend uh, in other other great uh, summits of recent past where the first thing you do is you empty the city, the venue of its people and say, you know, put restrictions on cars, say, why, you know, give holidays and say, why don't you take a break? Is this the way to go towards opening up? Well, you know, security is the bane of all our lives. Uh, and uh, I guess to some extent uh, there is inconvenience that the populace uh, has to bear. But I think, uh, you know, if not during the summit, but even prior to the summit, in the build-up to the summit, you can have a lot of other uh, engagements, a lot of other programs, activities involving the young people, even children. Uh, so I think a lot can be done. And as we were discussing, uh, you know, just a few minutes ago, there was a SAC rally, which also, uh, you know, involved all the people uh, of the SAC region. So there are lots of things I th think that can be done to really promote Sark and make it something for people to look forward to. Bringing kids out of schools and colleges and making them, um, giving them access to, a little bit of access, not the plenary, but other access to the deliberations, is that a bad idea? Is that a security threat? 
No, certainly. I mean, why not? In fact, you have this model UN. You can have a model SARC uh, for children. Why not? Let them, you know, in, in schools uh, have SARC summits at the level of children. So, Madam Ambassador, you said we must hire a consultant. I think somebody is there <laughs> sitting nearby. <laughs> but uh, despite your reservations on uh, the media, um, Ambassador Ray will know uh, very well that um, Eurovision is a success mainly because it is seen right through because of the media. So what is the role you expect the media to play? Uh, you see, in today's world, the media, it's a private media. It's the, not, uh, you know, there was a long time ago, there used to be a SARC audiovisual um, exchange between the government, uh, the BTV and the Nepal TV and the uh, uh, Doodarshan, there used to be this government channel exchange, but nobody used to watch it. So in this today's world of private media, uh, it's the media that has to come forward with ideas. And the government sector cannot feed uh, the ideas to the media and expect it to be a success. And um, uh, whatever they come up with, uh, the, I, I'm sure the leaders will be happy to support. Uh, if it's uh, going to promote the region. And uh, as Ambassador has been saying, uh, there could be SARC uh, song contests, there could be exchanges among school children. One very important uh, idea that struck my mind while I was listening to all of you was that we need to take SARC out of the capitals. The summit is uh, capital centric, but uh, you know, so many um, events could be organized outside the capitals in all the countries. And perhaps that would uh, help to help to spark a lot of interest among the general people, among the younger people. Uh, I'm sure children from Nepal uh, would love to go and visit the beaches of Cox's Bazar or go, I mean, all the countries of the children of the countries would love to go and visit the mangrove forests of uh, West Bengal and uh, Bangladesh. Um, children from Bangl Bangladesh would love to come and uh, go trekking uh, in the Himalayas. So we could uh, take you know, SARC away from the capital and make it less of a talk uh, discussion forum with, for the leaders and uh, take, come up with imaginative ideas for children or adults and youth for them to respond to. At the end of the day, we are talking about the summit of SARC, the heads of nations. They have to come out and they have to talk and they have to be the vibrant personalities which attract attention is that the way to go? Well, it is one of the way, but let me add to your previous uh, question, uh, which, to which I agree to both His Excellency and Her Excellency, is that I look at it two major issues here when you talk about shark coming out of its bucket. I think one is space and the other is media. Now, when I talk about space, is that there are quite a few uh, SARC related uh, institution or SARC related, uh, you know, like Chamber of Commerce, uh, SARC tourism and all. Had we given them space in this whole summit, maybe they would have come up with different plans for the last one week, just like a jamboree. So this whole SARC thing would be more people oriented and it would be an attraction, not only for, you know, the government officials or schools, but, you know, it would bring people from uh, the SARC nation to come and join. The second is media also has to play a very vital role and focus on not only the government staged uh, program or summit. Now let me tell you, like yesterday, a very important festival was open, which is called the Sark Handicraft Exhibition, where you have people coming from, I mean Sark Nation coming to exhibit their handicrafts and everything. But unfortunately, the media didn't carry that out. Maybe it just became a piece of a news and it, was, it remained as a news. So until unless the news or the media people also play a very vital role in promoting SARC out of the bucket of head of the government or head of the nation, then we'll be able to do something and you know that will also be lesson learned. Second thing is the head of the nation, uh, when they all assemble together, the dialogue between them also is very important. But I think dialogues on these other issues also should be one of the main key issues so that, you know, it will be easy for us to move forward. But personalities matter, don't you think? Well, personality does matter, but I think the vision and the thought are more important in those kind of summit. Um, Ambassador Ray, what should 
visiting uh, heads of government bring along big delegations, economic delegations and businessmen, industrialists and, and have um, them in dialogue? Well, I think so. I think, I think we need to have a SAC dialogue at every level, not just between the government sector or the business sector or academia and think tanks, but at the level of the youth, at the level of our entertainment industry, handicrafts, at every level. That is when SAC will really uh, belong to, to the people of the region. So I think that is extremely, uh, extremely important. And as to the forthcoming summit in Kathmandu, I think... Uh, uh, very warm congratulations and felicitations are due to the government of Nepal for having made such excellent arrangements. Uh, the Kathmandu city is looking very beautiful. It's all decked up. And I'm sure uh, all our delegations uh, will have a wonderful time uh, and a very fruitful uh, summit uh, in Nepal. But what does India expect from this summit? We would like to see a SARC which is very dynamic, which is uh, people-oriented, uh, which will promote... Uh, uh, greater regional economic integration and people-to-people -people contacts and we will work uh, sincerely towards this end. Will, you, um, will it be a focus of uh, the summit to encourage uh, more interaction between the leaders? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the very important aspects of the summit is the interaction between leaders. And it's not just a formal structured interaction. It is also an, in, an informal interaction at a retreat where the leaders are by themselves and can discuss any issues of uh, importance and, and, and relevance uh, uh, to them. Uh, so certainly uh, we are in favor of uh, uh, regular and frequent dialogue at the highest political level, in but addition to other levels. Do you think it should be more frequent, like uh, yearly? Well, I think that is something that our experts and others should look at in terms of the periodicity uh, you know, in the old days, if you remember, the ASEAN summits used to take place once every several years. Uh, now they take place twice a year. So it depends on the uh, pace at which the organization is growing, the content of the uh, uh, discussions. Uh, so I think this is something that really the, the, the experts and the delegations that will be uh, participating in the summit, this is something that they have to take stock of. Um, you know, they are, not to say that um, they are a little bit frivolous, but overall, um, Asia and APEC and these things, they seem to be like fun places, you know, people wear all those fancy uh, <laughs> shirts and all that, which are specially stitched, and uh, it's, it's uh, suck too stodgy and brighten it up. Uh, that's just the photo op of the <laughs> ASEAN and the APEC leaders. I'm sure behind the scene they do work in, in the, you know, black suits sure, sure. and <laughs> in a very serious manner. But um, as we have been, I think that the whole theme of today's discussion has been that SARC needs to uh, have an image makeover. And uh, there is this serious problem that uh, SARC is, um, image problem that SARC is suffering from. And even when actual things get done, uh, the SARC doesn't get credit for it. So, yes. For instance? We, uh, for instance, uh, you know, there are very small areas where SARC has been moving forward. Uh, you know, areas of health, uh, areas of uh, agriculture, um, the SARC Development Fund, uh, the, even SAFTA, uh, connectivity issues. There are small, de you know, progresses are being made. Uh, but uh, those are not promoted at all. Uh, we don't even uh, recognize that things are moving ahead. So I think we need to, to do a lot of rethinking on how to promote uh, the achievements of SARC. Um, just to come back to the point of um, just um, uh, photo ops, but when those um, gatherings take place, that photo op kickstarts that whole summit and it goes to another level because everybody watches it and you can understand a fancy, uh, you know, your leaders in fancy clothes. So it puts it there, right in the center. That is the importance of that. Um, yes, it puts uh, everybody in a festive mood. And I think that's the purpose of the retreat itself. The retreat, Not only really festive mood. I mean, I mean, it gives you great publicity. Everybody is looking at it. <laughs> it does. It okay. does give you a, a publicity. Um, and um, I don't know whether our leaders should also be encouraged to think in those terms. Um, but uh, the retreat, you know, it does put our leaders also in a, in a situation where they can informally discuss many of the trickier issues which they couldn't uh, talk in a formal panel, so uh, in the formal platform. 
So that, that uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, option is there for them to be informal with each other and talk to each other. So you are the host of this gathering of leaders. So what do you expect? What does Nepal expect from this summit? Well, I just wanted to add on what Her Excellency said on this photo ops. <laughs> I, I think uh, South Asia is very unique. And we all have very strong cultural uh, and, uh, you know, blended society. So for us to come and have a photo ops with different designers' clothes that we all wear as a national dress is also to show to the world, you know, how rich we are in culture. You know, that's one aspect of it because we're all dressed up in our own national dress, custom, so, you know, it shows us. But uh, may I interrupt that? Sure. Uh, Bangladesh takes the prize for colorful. Sure, I'm going to say that's good. But that's the reason we're all together. With more <laughs> colors, we're together. You know? Well, I, I, I hope, I mean, see, my expectation with this whole summit is that, as I said, like, and being a commerce minister, having attended SAFTA, that, you know, we'll be able to make some headway on SAFTA agreement. That's number one. And Nepal and the rest of the SAC nation will at least be able to be in a melting pot with our culture and society so that we could be integrated even stronger and we stand uh, united for years to come. So if uh, briefly you want to say, what is the success mantra for this summit? Well, the success mantra for this summit is all head of the state to come in together, to be frank, and also that we're able to put our things on the table and to come up with a common cause, which is development, prosperity. Madam Ambassador. Um, uh, yes, I think uh, I will take uh, it from where Mr. Minister has said. Uh, we all need to work together for our common prosperity and socioeconomic development. And the best I agree entirely, and I think we should do this in a manner uh, to demonstrate how we are injecting new dynamism, new vitality uh, into the SAC process. So we take it out of uh, stodginess, make it vital, energize it, uh, make it... Uh, uh, conscious of um, economic progress and, uh, and vibrant, vibrant, and we thank you all for not just being here but agreeing with everybody. And I think SAC must be the least uh, contentious going by this discussion of um, <laughs> gatherings of um, international leaders. So we wish it all the success. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Madam Ambassador. Thank, Thank you, you and very much, uh, Ambassador Ray, for participating in this discussion. So we look forward to SARC Summit 2014 in Kathmandu. Thank you. Thank you very much.